Okay, we are Sunday the 5th of May 2019 and we are coming together in the integral chat to talk about the states of consciousness. And I would say we do, it was good your idea Ryan to have two and two and a half minutes of shares maximum. And can you take the time when we uh, go around? Okay, good. And good. And I think we have a short introduction. It can be two and a half minutes if you really want to uh, as a, as a check-in. But uh, I would say just a check-in general and then we go into the topic. That's what I would prefer. Check-in normally, uh, what I understand and check-in is that we say how we are, how we feel. If, what could maybe hinder us to be fully present at, at this uh, at this event where we are together and, and things like that. It's more the personal uh, attitude we have at the, at the moment. And then afterwards we go into the topic, if you agree to do it like this. Okay. I can start. I'm uh, quite okay <laughs> today. I, I have done seven or eight bags with old clothes and I will throw them all away and uh, or give them to the Red Cross or something. So I'm beginning to declutter my, my surrounding and hope to go into a different future with that. So far with me. I cannot hear you, um, Dave. Can it's you hear him? Pretty soft, Devin. I can't hear him, so I put the earphones on. It's it's even worse. We'll be moving around a little bit. I'll be back in a sec. Um, I'm having a sort of brazenly like orange and blue day. Um, I was looking into like loads of sort of automation and sort of, um, musing on that. Like the, I was kind of had this crazy idea that a lot of what I do for work, I could potentially automate like all the boring stuff. Um, which is quite a sort of interesting combination with like Sundays, my sort of traditional sort of like Christian kind of Sunday. Um, so kind of reading and stuff and, uh, Bible quotes and like reading some of my sort of favorite Christian websites. So, um, um, yeah, just kind of in quite good spirits. Um, and that's kind of tinted most of my day. So that's me. I can pop in. Um, it's Tim and I'm struggling with, um, uh, self-worth this morning so i'm having a little bit of a less less pleasant uh morning but it's brief as i get going here i suspect that um a little bit of focus will shift that whether or not that's a useful thing to do that's it are you uh without video on purpose yeah, I need to um, move around and, okay. and do a couple of things. Hi, I'm uh, having an orange day. I'm rather scattered in too many directions, hyper. Uh, I'm going to be checking out at 10.15 because we've got a big thing happening at church and I've got to be out the door. But I will eagerly participate here. A lot of other things are coming together real fast in a good way. Um, I may be launching a blog in a couple of weeks, and I'm dealing with stuff I'm very uncomfortable with. So I'm over-organized and scattered at the same time. So kind of orange, but a little fragmented this morning. Um. I'll just I'll just say that uh, I'm really happy uh, the last few days because my uh, goat had a couple of babies, 
So um, I've been playing with the babies and um, yeah, happy to be here. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, we have a retreat going on here and so the caterer is going to be pulling up and the dogs are kind of going crazy. So I may have to be muted or go off uh, on video for a few minutes here. I'll see how it works. Devin, do you want to try your uh, mic again? See how it is? Hmm. No, we can't, we can't hear you at all. Maybe he can um, call in with the telephone. Um, I have to find out how that the number is. You, you start and I find out the number and then I put it in the chat, okay? Go ahead, go ahead and start, Ryan. Can you take over? Because I have to figure out how to find the telephone number. Oh, sorry, were you talking to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I'll, uh, I'll just hand this off to, I mean, we're supposed to talk about states today. And I guess that's uh, something that I'm, that's the one element of integral theory that I have the least amount of understanding about. And I don't really know, um, I don't really understand the concept of states um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to people who have a lot of interest and expertise in this area and I'll be, do, be doing a lot of listening today. So I don't know who wants to feel inspired to jump in. I think Ken Wilbur has muddied the waters on this. Um, in his recent book with the religion of tomorrow, he made a valiant effort to pull the world's wisdom traditions together and synthesize what they all say and work them into his meta system. But um, it's, it's pretty murky. And so it's kind of, and this is kind of hard to know where to find footing to even begin. Anybody else want to jump in here? What ways do you find it murky? What, what creates the murkiness? Do you know? Uh, Actually, we had a really big, intense email exchange from our, what is it, the Monday Zoom chat with uh, Charles Markser. And he, he uh, defined some ways, and it's in high-flown academic ease that I cannot reproduce off the top of my head. But um, do, do we have subtle bodies? Let me, let me just, just jump in. Do we have subtle bodies? Is there any such thing? Is it a figment of everybody's imagination? And can, what Ken Wilber had to say about it was um, confusing rather than elucidating. How do we account for all these experiences the wisdom traditions talk about? Do we have astral bodies? Do we have subtle bodies? Um, are we conscious outside our physical bodies? How does this relate to people, you know, psychic experiences? Aiming it back at Ken Wilber, what about these subtle states that he talks about? The psychic, the subtle, the causal, all of these experiences he talks about. How do these relate to the matter of, quote, subtle bodies? And how do we make, even make sense of it all? So um, I've had a fair amount of experience dealing with this. Um, in my spiritual tradition that I've been a member of for 38 years, and I'm probably running out of time here, but I've had to not only teach it, but counsel people who came to me with questions. So I have a very solid body of a very solid mental map that fits well with Ken Wilbers. But this is, this is not simple stuff, people. So I'll stop here. Um, I find myself really interested in it but I'm sort of like not sure what the the integral take is on like I think my knowledge of integral states is sort of like you have the gross you have the subtle and you have the causal and um I understand there's a difference between uh state experience and stage to sort of clarify like just because someone can get into a 
spiritual stage uh, state doesn't mean that they're sort of things that waking up versus growing up um so i'm curious if anybody has any more knowledge about the what the integral stance is on um uh, states and stuff but i think some of my knowledge does kind of converge like um um i know a little bit about like um like brainwave research and stuff like this like i don't know if people know of uh, i awake they do these kind of binaural beat kind of audio stuff to get into different states and it's kind of interesting the way modern neuroscience has kind of um mapped out a lot of these kinds of things and they kind of converge a little bit onto some of the subtle and causal but it's more um it's more vast than that like you have quite a lot of different states and also like you could loosely say that um for example delta is a causal state but it's kind of um it seems to be a little bit like the kind of spectrum of light or the what is it electromagnetic spectrum where it kind of moves up like quite nuanced like they have um um kind of the basic states and then even they, they seem to almost like discover new ones like the um, gamma state which is a really fast one um that you say like tibetan monks and things that meditate long compassion get into but also um like top athletes like kind of it being a hypersensual kind of thing and then even uh one possibly even faster than that um epsilon i think um and i'm kind of really interested in that like as a i guess as a, as a sort of modality to to develop but i'm not sure how it relates to the integral theory of state experience um i'm, I'm aware of the time as well but, and also there was there was another one that I heard of I remember Ken talking to a coach and she expanded the idea of states to beyond just a spiritual experience like emotional states um useful and negative and in the therapy world and all this kind of stuff um so to me it's a bit of a mess of like my concept my understanding of what the integral take is on all this kind of thing yeah thank you um Paul uh, I also would like to start from states as we experience them without going into theory too much and maybe later um, because we are all all the time in some state and I would be interested in in the description of how you feel these states and how you can differentiate them. But I see that Devin is on the telephone. You could be in the same time also on, on video so we can also see you. But if you prefer just... Uh, listening or talking that's fine too i will give you the chance to check in and say yours if you want okay is it is it clear now yeah we can hear it okay wonderful i think the for, from my perspective states becomes very important when we look at states that are very full and states that are very empty states of fullness such as being in a state of psychological flow where time and space sort of disappear and there's this fullness that comes forth of you know kind of being on the leading edge of who we are and our challenges and our skills and who we might become as well and then these transcendent states this emptiness of potentiality and also recognizing how we show up very differently depending upon where we are in our states. As Karen stated earlier, she's very much in an, in an orange sort of landing place today. And, you know, I think I'm in a, a, a fairly green sort of landing place right now. And that's not going to be the case perhaps later today or perhaps tomorrow. To, to really recognize that starting point from a stage perspective, yes, and also from from the state. And I'll leave it as, at that for right now. This is very interesting. I, I like what you what you said that we can draw a parallel from the stage uh, experience which we feel to be in, and uh, then uh, from that derive the state in which we feel. That's hmm. good. So I would really be interested in not only these trends, these three or four uh, 
characteristic stage of which Ken Wilber is talking all the time. It, to me, for many, for a long time, it seemed that there are only these states existing. But for me, there are so many more states existing. And as Paul said, also the emotional states, that's all, all states experiences. And we, in, in integral theory, it's all connected to spirituality states, but that's not necessarily the, the case. I mean, it can be then that we are more, you know, in beta, alpha, whatever, uh, in, in certain experiences, but, and then this is like a meditative state and this is like non-dual, non I don't know what, you know, but it's, it's, doesn't seem to me the fundament. The fundament is the experience of what state am I in. That's what I want to throw in and ask you to comment on that. I would say there's a spectrum of states exactly as there is a spectrum of developmental stages, structures. The difference is that the developmental structures are developmental. They come online in a chronological sequence. Um, Ken Wilber talks about two different axes. There's the, the stage structure axis that we've already discussed when we went up the, the, you know, up the stages. But then the state spectrum, the spectrum of states of experience, that's a separate axis. They're, I see them as two parallel axes. Now, we can experience any of the states. All of the states are potentials at any one of the developmental stages. We're more likely to experience certain states depending on what stage we're, what structure we're at at the moment. Like we're much more likely to experience raw emotion when we're in red, but we have access to every one of these states. And yes, emotion is on that spectrum of states. And there are wisdom traditions that analyze this in great detail. Um, it, it's a very coherent spectrum. But yes, we can access any state from any of the structural stages. But we're more likely to experience, you know, the higher we are in one, the more likely we are to be experiencing a higher on the other. So yes, the states, there are a lot of states. They're very fluid. We can move in and out through them. I like the analogy, I'll try to wrap up here. In a previous talk, somebody mentioned um, a row of glasses. And the glasses are discrete and separate, but the water, they're, they're, they, they all have water in them, but they're sitting in a tub of water, so the water can flow in and out of any of the glasses. So I'm starting to think of the structure stages, you know, red, blue, all those, as the cups, but the water that flows in and out of them is the states. So that if the states are very fluid and we can access any of them at any time. How we interpret them and experience them depends on the glass we happen to be sitting in at the time, whether we're at red or whether we're at green or turquoise or what have you. I don't know if that's very coherent. I'm kind of putting this together as I sit here. I was just thinking, for me, there's something that immediately comes into um, my thoughts when I think of states, and it sort of relates to the metaphor you just said, uh, Karen, about like, um, I'm hearing like a container and then like flow. Because um, it seems like those two things really come out in state. It's kind of like states can be um, super useful if directed. Like um, the spiritual states come obviously, but also like um, emotional, like the the right state or the right flow um, in the right um, uh, context can kind of like be skillfully used. Like I know um, you mentioned anger, like I often found that kind of fire and anger is pretty great for getting stuff done or like workout and all this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, maybe not so good for other things like uh, meditating or um, uh, I don't know, gaining rapport or, or something like this. Um, and for me, I think that that's the useless thing I, I find in, in talking about states is, uh, actually using them. Like I remember, um, I used to do some hypnotherapy, um, which I actually, I won't really elaborate too much, but I remember doing it on a, on this girl and I wasn't even like particularly skilled. She had all these problems with the digestion and all this kind of stuff. Um, 
and so there was like just some basic like guided imagery and all this kind of thing she hadn't left uh the town that we lived in in like a decade or something because she'd go out she'd get anxious it would affect her bowels and then it would get in like this vicious cycle and i remember doing just a few weeks and i would say that this was kind of like a theta state that we were playing with so the kind of dream state and and then she went out like and she didn't even think about it um there was like this huge breakthrough so I guess it just makes me think of the potential power of states when you actually know what you're doing um, and, uh, and are directing them. Yeah, Paul, and I think uh, also states always have a huge power. If we can direct them, then we are fortunate. But I think mainly in our lives, we fall into them. That's my hypothesis. And when we learn the skills to use them, we can use them for good or for ill, we can use them malevolently or benevolently. And Ryan and I had a previous conversation about this. So that's yet another dimension. Yeah, it makes me wonder how, how much um, group groups can influence states in, in others, you know, like group euphoria or group rage or um, even group sort of sometimes whipping themselves into some maybe causal states by certain prompts that happen from outside individuals. I was in a group last night, it was a very large council circle. And at first I was like, oh no, you know, cause I kind of avoid those kind of things. But the, the way the woman set it up, it was kind of, she just kind of created this space and then as it went around, you, I was like, wow, this is the best of green there ever is. People were expressing some totally beautiful, like, and, it, and then it just sort of built upon each other. And it was a really like a wonderful feeling in the group, you know, of just like, and it just made me have like much more uplifted state of mind myself, just to, to be in the circle. So... There is uh, research about the influence we have uh, on each other within the auras, you know, when people um, uh, like each other, the auras they can embrace and connect. And when they don't like each other and they are too near, they t the auras tend to, to, to go away. But anyway, I think we always, at least when we are near, influence the others around us. And that means we influence the state in which the other person is. And we have also the power to influence the state of, of other people. So yeah, Karen, for the better or for the worse, it depends how our intention is. Or oh, our, our state of mind, you know, when we are in a bad state, so for, for the sake of other people better stay away. <laughs> But even the negative states can be worked with. I mean, the way I approach is, we're talking specifically emotional energy now because there's always that aspect to it, is it's all just energy. That's how I conceive of this. It's, how, it's what we do with the energy. Even the so-called really negative emotions can, if they're contained and channeled, appropriately can be put to very powerful uses. It's all just like, it's all fuel in the fuel tank. It's, um, do you crash the car or do you make a delivery to somebody who needs it? So the emotions, even the hard, dense ones, sometimes we need to remove ourselves from situations, but that energy can always be put to a more skillful use, no matter how dark or negative it seems at the time. And do this is talking specifically about emotional states now. Do you have an example for that out of your life, maybe? I'll think about that and get back to you. I also would love to hear about that, Karen, because I have to say this topic of conversation speaks very much to my mood this morning. And, uh, and I'm hoping on an experiential level to, uh, to uh, hear more from folks about um, A, the transformation, just, just knowing, like I think Heidi, you're the one who was saying, part of the key is understanding how to consciously use uh, and choose maybe 
or at least work with the state that you're in. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in a sort of thirsty way this morning, uh, even though I'm sure I have these skills right at the moment they are eluding me. So I'll be excited to hear when people feel like sharing that. It made me think of, um, I think Dev, uh, Devin was saying that he was feeling in green because I, I can relate to my personal experience. Like I used to go on these surfing platforms a lot because there was a lot of emotional stuff being thrown around. I don't know if this is unfair to green or just some of the people that I've been exposed to, but I think like, um, like hanging around with you guys, like really appreciating in my own head, I think of it as a bit of like blend of like orange and green, but I have a certain distaste for sort of, um, expressing emotion or being in a negative state that's to the point where there's like, there's no action behind it. There's some wallowing quality to it that doesn't feel very useful. And it sort of feels to me like more integral that there's something about maybe using the emotions or using the state that feels more, um, more chosen or more deliberate than my experience of other people who are at green. But also if I remember my own, experience of green like i've been in plenty of pretty negative states that um i would actually sit in to the point that it was probably masochistic um because i think i was kind of signing up to the thought of like you know if you're dealing with this painful stuff then you must be developing or you must be dealing with it um i think in hindsight a lot of the time what I, I really wasn't and actually i was kind of um expressing something in a way that that wasn't healthy or i needed to uh I, needed to, I don't know direct it more or maybe like it was too much of a state at the time i could have done with with another state but anyway i i, I just seems to me like there's there's more ability to um be interested and to run <laughs> things integral that kind of naturally seems to come out of green It, it, it also seems that green is an era where states are particularly embraced. And also if we look culturally at happiness, for example, derives from the word happen chance, this state that we happen to come into. And, and, the, and there's this feeling, there's this short term permanent feeling that isn't necessarily earned that we tend to kind of bleed into or, or pop into that seems to be, particularly prevalent at, uh, at green and, and also reflective culturally as well. And I think it's really important that, that when, when we look culturally at, at who, we, who we might become, that, that there is an importance of also bringing forth stages so that there is an enduring essence, an enduring place that, that, holds, that holds these states. The last thing I'll mention here is that for a couple of years, I, I worked at a, essentially a spiritual college that was so incredibly focused on states, on Eastern-based states without any recognition of Western psychological development. And there are great, great perils that, uh, that came from that sort of uh, um, kind of amplification of the one and the divorcing of the other. Amen. So to, to Tim, just I want to share with you, um, I had passed about 10 months of uh, quite difficult states. And for me, uh, was, it was anger and sadness and things like that. So negative, I'm talking about negative states. And to coming, come into a positive state again, I very often use music. And it would be even better to move with music. But sometimes I was in, in, in the state that I didn't even want to move, you know. But at least when, when I, I love music and especially classical music, certain kinds are better and certain kinds are worse. And I, I also have done music therapy. So I know about the, the power of music. So if you really love a piece of music, which can can give you that what you need in the moment. I, I would uh, recommend to everybody to, to use music or dance movement or whatever they feel that gives a relief to, to the, the emotional, spiritual, whatever state they are in. And uh, yeah, 
that's it more or less to to know out of your past what is making you happy when we want to, to use this word and that even if it doesn't work immediately but at the long run it does it does work it, it the, the body or the mind has a remembrance a, a, a memory of that and it brings you back into this into this where you want to go gradually or immediately Okay, Heidi, thanks. I'll bounce off of that. Um, uh, sorry, I'm going to get theoretical just a little bit, because we are really bearing down on quote, emotional states. And that's one kind of one category. So I'm going to go up the spectrum, we have physical states. And you mentioned that Heidi, that, that moving the body, our five senses, that we're, when we're perceiving through our five senses, we're in a physical state. The next subtle is our emotional states, and they profoundly influence each other. Like you said, with music and movement, we can very much influence our emotional state. The next most subtle up is our mental state, our thoughts, our discursive intellect. And again, what we think, what we tell ourselves profoundly affects our emotional state. There's a lot of cross influence, right? Next level above that in subtlety is you get into the spiritual or soul levels, the intuition, um, the being consciousness bliss, you're in the zone, you know, when, when that, those, those, those wonderful, quote, beginning of the spiritual states, and there are several beyond that, too. Uh, we, I just want to bring this up because we are mostly cycling now around the emotions, but I wanted to point out that all of these states profoundly influence each other. It's, they're all part of a larger organism. It's like that we have an endocrine system and a circulatory system and a musculoskeletal system, and they're distinct but they all are profoundly interconnected. So as we move through the states, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, okay, this is emotional state, this is mental state, this is physical state, this is one of the more spiritual states. So I'm, that's how I'm translating what I'm hearing now. Yeah, thank you, Karen. And for me, it's also that they really influence each other. I have done once the dervish uh, dance, always turning around, you know, you, you get definitely in, <laughs> in sort of a spiritual state. Or the people who do the sports, which are very dangerous, they often do it to get into a different, uh, in a sort of a spiritual state, you know. And um, so yeah. I think it's interconnected. Yeah, I don't think it's just a physical state. Like I've talked to a lot of people who do contact improv and that sort of thing, and they almost all say they get into a flow state. And the way they're talking about it, it's not just some physical, it it's actually sounds like a causal state to me, like a spiritual state of beyond, although I don't know who's going to determine that. You know, certainly that paper that I read on post-metaphysics was kind of describing that as a purple meme state, you know, to be caught in that, but I don't know. How do we determine that? So I think that's interesting that people are saying, what, is this even real? You know, us, is there a difference between these so-called states of spiritual ecstasy and some kind of low, you know, lower meme state or something? There's one thing as well I want to expand a little bit because Karen, I felt like you expanded it out of emotional states and I haven't thought about this that much, but it sort of occurs to me that states as well probably also occur in the, the other quadrants. Like I was thinking of, for example, um, like our seasons of state, you know, like winter, summer, spring and all this kind of stuff or um, the way that at times culture or sort of development in the upper right and all this kind of stuff like you can have kind of creative building up periods and then you can have um destruction and building down like you you kind of get that with some of the sort of sympathetic and parasympathetic um nervous system and all this kind of stuff so i feel like it's a i feel like as a concept it's kind of really useful and probably can be expanded like way beyond uh what it, what it kind of currently has and sort of uh sort of stereotypical kind of the, what has been used so far in kind of integral world. I would say that the states have correlates in all four quadrants. States as we're discussing them, I guess would be an upper left that is my experience. I'm experiencing an emotion. I'm experiencing a train of thoughts in my head. I'm experiencing my body moving. I'm experiencing bliss or, or radiant forms. 
but these have correlates in the other four quadrants. For instance, our, our brain waves, if we're having emotions, our endocrine system is working and our blood pressure is changing and so on. Then we have the we space that Kate was talking about. We're influencing other people around us. And I'm not sure what the lower right, but so anyway, Paul, as I cognize this, the states, as we're talking about them, are an upper left quadrant. They're an experience, a subjective experience we're having, but then they have their correlates in the other three quadrants. Um, oh, okay. I'd love to jump in on the topic. Um, this is a, a topic that I have um, a lot, a lot of experience with. And um, so, Paul, I love that you were mentioning the seasons. Um, ebb and flow and cycle are two of the most valuable things in my practice. And um, I experience the states um, in this moment through uh, that, that concept of linearity versus ebb and flow and cycle, where um, the, the growth states are very linear. There's a lot of fluctuation, and it's like cause and effect. And the subtle states, we start to experience the cycle, the seasons where they, they come around again. And that sense of like cycle and coming around, um, each one giving way to the other, helps us to recognize the substratum from which that subtlety of ebb and flow is happening within and gives us a greater sense of stability that helps us transition into the causal state. And um, from there, then the non-dual also, which is a lot harder to talk about, um, but, but a little bit possible. I think, I think it is possible to talk about it a little. Um, so, and Paul, I love what you were mentioning about the four quadrants too, because I feel like that's one way that we can build um, like healthy systems and healthy states of consciousness into all four quadrants by noticing um, how linear, how cyclical, and how stable is the substratum on which we're experiencing the thing through each of the four quadrants, whatever that is. Thanks. Yeah, about, about what you just said, Natalie, and, and Paul, what you're saying about the quadrants, I was watching a documentary um, with uh, Signori Weaver called Envision Imagining the Future, I think, on uh, Future Thinkers. And one of the things that they were doing was they would have someone walk around in a city. I think this is in Germany, a city in Germany. And the researchers put electrodes on the person's head, like on a, as like a cap. And the, and the urban planners, the city planners, were looking at the person walk around on a map that came up on the computer. And if the person felt anxiety or nervousness on a certain street, that part of the street would light up red. And if they were happy or you know, feeling good feelings, that area of the street would light up like blue or like cool colors. So they, they were literally planning how to design the city to optimize well-being based on these upper right quadrant mapping of states. I thought that was just a really cool kind of integral-ish idea and kind of like a future how people are going to plan cities is based on how people experience happiness. And then it's like, oh, oh you're walking down a certain street. Maybe there's a lot of congestion, a lot of traffic, and it brings up a lot of anxiety and nervousness. And they would redesign that street and then have other people walk down it again with the same, with that cap and see if it changes color. So you can see how people's happiness is reflected um, and then design a city to enhance that level of happiness. I think that is so cool, Ryan. Thanks for sharing that. I think it'd be really interesting also to, as a means of taking a look at uh, how people from different demographics are experiencing the same thing. Um, wow, that's just neat. If I'm president of the United States, every city and every town in the United States would be designed in that way. You got my vote. There's something about uh, what Natalie was saying. I can't remember what you, what you said, but it made me think. I think it was something about you saying maybe resilience or stability. Um, and it makes me think possibly of an, uh, what I think is maybe the stage above integral or turquoise, whatever, whatever the hell it's called, where there's like, I, I sort of noticed over the years recently that I slowly seem to have this more of like a meta awareness of things changing. Like I remember when I was very ingrained, it would kind of, there'd be a lot of anxiety about moods changing or seasons changing and all this kind of stuff. And um, I don't know, there seems something, it kind of obvious to me that seems to come out like when you have this big integral net to be able to grab stuff, 
that you can also kind of appreciate how vast uh, change can happen. Like, for example, I don't know if this is integral or not, but it's like over the last few years, I've been really aware of how much, how different summer is for me. Like I work way harder. I'm a lot more extrovert and have a lot more energy and all this kind of stuff. And like knowing the difference gives me a lot more stability rather than kind of battling what might be happening in the, in the other quadrants, like actually being able to be like, okay, so the seasons are going to affect me or whatever it happens to be, that's going to affect my state change to actually like harness that instead of, um, instead of battling it is kind of quite exciting. And also seems to me pretty damn vast as well. The amount of things that can affect states from, from all the quadrants interacting with each other. Um, so, so wonderful, Paul. That's a lot of what I'm, what I'm pointing to that I feel like the integrated causal state um, with the subtle and the gross is recognition of that. And that it's something that creates that stability as we notice the ebb and flow. Um, even in our like the, the state of the world today where we're destroying our earth and our political systems are wreaking havoc, we can um, enter and rest in the causal state in a form of spiritual bypass where it's like nothing matters, everything is consciousness, we will all be okay. Or we can recognize that this is part of the ebb and flow and cycle of consciousness on our planet and it will give rise to a new order of something. And what can we support that carries through while working very hard and continuing to feel that sense of stability of um, the substratum from which all of this chaos is happening within. Yeah, wow. Um, um, my um, my con concept of the causal state includes that appreciation that in this manifest age world, everything ebbs and flows and the transience and people in, in the spiritual literature and all the wisdom traditions, this grasp that how transient it all is and great anxiety comes up around that. But if you get through that, then you get into those wonderful Buddhist states the Buddhists talk about where you directly experience the incredible preciousness of all that is. Every moment is shining. Everything is shining. These are to me, I, I kind of categorize them in the causal level of experience of state. Now I want to take that Natalie back to what you've been talking about the stability. The stability is absolutely essential if we're going to use, if we're going to live from these states skillfully at all levels, the stability is important. And that's where the structure stages come in. Because as I'm cognizing this, our stability comes from being healthy at whatever structure level we are. And, you know, we're, we're kind of in all of them. And that's where the waking, the, the, the cleaning up comes in too. So the stability, the, the structural stability, and then to experience these states and the flow among them because they are always in flow. And, and we can break through the, the terror and anxiety into these wonderful transcendent shining states. At least that's what the wisdom traditions promise us. Thank you, Natalie, you just kind of sparked that in me. So some organizing um, things. Ryan has uh, audio problems too. And Devon, I saw you coming up before and then you disappeared. Do you want to, to contribute a little bit? Because it's difficult if you don't see us and just jump in. And also Devi, I see she is here. Yeah, hi. Yeah, yeah. Now you have to decide who, who, who goes first. <laughs> I'm not chomping at the bit. I'm just kind of, I arrived late and I'm taking in uh, what is being shared. So please, someone else who is uh, trying to speak. Okay. Similar, sim similarly, I'm appreciating the contributions and uh, not, I'm not feeling called to, to speak a whole lot right now, but I'm listening very intently. This is organizational. I just want to make sure that those of us who weren't here for the last couple of sessions know that we are trying to limit ourselves to no more than two and a half minutes at a time. Just to make sure everybody knows that. And does anyone mind restating kind of what the uh, overarching theme of the discussion is this week? Yeah, it's about the states, states of consciousness. And we were talking about all the states we 
we are um, aware of. So emotional states and whatever physical states, spiritual states, and we were talking about how they are connected and also connected with the levels of development, with the quadrants and so on. Right. I did notice as I was listening to people sharing that there was um, not conscious confusion, but talking about stages like uh, the color ladder uh, in the integral or um, the spiral dynamics kind of integral and states that they're like a mixing, which of course it is all mixed up or I guess how I experience it differently than what people were sharing is embedded. Like at one point, for example, somebody was mentioning the um, organic hierarchy of physical, subtle, mental, causal, something like that. I do not experience, nor has my descriptive conceptual understanding ever been, that these are separate Rather, both my experience and therefore, when we're speaking about it descriptively or conceptually, my experience is that these are embedded. Whether we start from gross to more um, subtle, intangible, or whether we start sort of at the top of the peak, you could say, at the most uh, intangible, non-dual, and we can indeed talk about it. In fact, there's a whole method. There's whole methods around speaking about this, which can't be described. <laughs> but if we can lightly hold the describing of this um, space that we're sharing, so to speak that we can a actually can assist us in moving into the direct experience and perception of this, like space awareness sort of situation. So it, for me, if I, I guess if I were to pick a, um, if I had to pick a metaphor or symbol, something more soft, it's more like these Matryoshka dolls, right? that the physical is this outer, larger, grosser, and then there's subtle, energetic, and mental, conceptual, and causal, non-dual. That would just be the easy breakdown of four basic. But I don't see them as states. I see them as like in this doll that they're like all embedded and inseparable. And every one of those levels is connected and has aspects that are still there uh, as the other levels. So I just wanted to share that because it's something really fundamental to my experience. And I didn't, that's not at all what I was hearing people either understanding or sharing about their experience. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, are you, is your audio going on again? Yeah, I'm, I'm back, thanks. Oh, okay, good. Um, thanks for sharing that, Davey. I feel really resonant with that. Um, that feels very true in my experience. It's hard to separate them. And part of what I'm um, understanding from your, your pointing is how when we wake up in causal, that helps us wake up more in subtle and wake up more in gross because of how they're nested. If we have that strong foundation, we notice more. We're, we're um, in a greater sense of intimacy with the more subtle and gross states. Does that feel true for you? Is that like what you were wanting to say? Um, I really appreciate what you're saying. It's not uh, what I would say, but I'm not, I'm not at odds in any way with uh, what you're sharing. 
I think what does uh, come up for me is just to additionally point out my experience is salad, not soup. So there's still all these distinctions happening. In fact, the st distinctions are much more refined and distinguishable. It's not swill. It doesn't all just, you know, disappear in this vast kind of infantile pre, right? That would be a pre-trans fallacy to have this idea that these, a causal or non-dual state is, is amorphous. All these distinctions remain and even some of them disappear, but they become more refined. And actually, life is lived in the distinctions. Right? It's not this black and white binary dualistic view of world or experience. It's like the sh subtle shades, the nuances of gray become more and more nuanced and appreciated. I was going to, I was just going to say, like, I think part of it for me it has this really strong um, throat chakra vibe. And I actually think of that in relation to what you're saying, Debbie. Like, I think for me, there's something about the throat chakra that really opens up um, the nuance. And also, I was kind of having it in my experience, like listening to, like, when somebody else speaks with a certain sort of quality, I actually go into a, um, a different a different state based on how they're speaking, but also with the throat thing, I think, I think on the one hand, there's, there can be like a blurred sense of boundaries. Like I think of, I was making this analogy about like the electromagnetic spectrum, that there's this kind of vibrational um, spectrum. Basically you have the same thing in music. Like how do you were talking about using music in order to get into states that you can have like, you can have a distinction between like one note, like A and B. But then you can also have this vibrational um, contingency between them. That's like you can you can make like smaller and smaller um, gradations. And for me, I don't know. There's there's something about the whole something about using the threat check in relation to states that seems really powerful. One in like seeing what state you're in, being able to make more nuanced distinctions, um, and also in the sense of the analogy that it often seems like. Um, things with sound and harmony seem very fitting with states. The, to me, it feels better to be in a in a coherent state where all the energies are building on top of each other, rather than where there's kind of a mess of states that are actually making for kind of a less powerful uh, experience or or kind of our expression. There's something about knowing what state you're in and harnessing it that makes it more. Um, Coherent. It, it, I, and it, every time I think of states, I always go into these like sound, sound-based metaphors. Hmm. So um, yeah. Can you can you say more um, bluntly what you mean by throat checks? I'm getting what you're talking about from the context, but if you um, could just go back to like fundamentally what that is for you. So a throat chakra. Oh, throat chakra with yeah. you. Okay. I wasn't, I was getting throat check. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. So I'm, I'm sorry that uh, Jeremy said he couldn't come today and uh, not even next uh, Thursday. I would be curious what he is saying about the, these things. I'm, getting a little bit into his course of the, um, of Gebser. And I'm beginning to see things in a different way. And I'm, I'm for instance, listening, he, he was saying it has very much to do with the um, magic, uh, uh, with the magic, I don't even know, I don't want to call it stage, not even. And that when we are listening attentively, to whatever, to other people or to ourselves, uh, it, what we might be doing when we do meditation, then this 
is bringing you into a state. And I'm wondering if these other states, the, the, what you are talking about, these, or these higher uh, spiritual states, aren't they also connected with your emotional state? Because when you feel bliss, that's feeling, that's it's, it's sort of an emotion, and, and, you know, I, I don't know, I'm just asking. I do think I maybe have been there sometime, but I would never have called it that way. But <laughs> I, I, I'm feeling a little bit uh, wanting to, to, instead of separating all these things, uh, to, to collecting them a little bit more together, weaving them together. And what I've understood from Jeremy that um, the, this approach of GAPSA is more a synthesis while we in our verbal thing it's more putting it into sections cutting it in analysis i'm i'm wondering what you think about that i think we need both as we go up the cognitive levels you know up piaget's structure states which correspond with wilbur's and spiral dynamics our ability to cognize differences goes greater and greater and greater. But especially at the throat chakra, Paul, then we start cutting everything apart. But also as we grow in cognitive ability, as we go up the structure states, we become able to put those pieces back together in a larger organic interacting whole. And this, there's a parallel in biology. We went from being very simple cells, basically blobs of protoplasm, to these incredibly differentiated bodies that we are now. So as we go up the levels, both in states and structures, we are able to make more nuanced distinctions, you know, more subtle discernments of, you know, wow, our heart pumps blood. We discovered this 400 years ago. Now we understand, excuse me, <clears throat> now we understand the body's circulatory system, but it, but it interacts intimately with the body's endocrine system and digestive system. We have all these different, we understand that we have different systems, but they're all part of one organic body. And as we grow in consciousness in both states and structures, we go back and forth. It's, it, we, it's, we go back and forth between more distinctions and more organic interconnectedness into one larger whole. And so Heidi's emphasizing that we want this to all to be part of something coherent and, and that belongs together in a unity. But we also want to make these discerning distinctions so that we become more and more skillful in our lives and our world. So I'm seeing this dance between, you know, differentiation, reintegration at a higher level, then we differentiate further, then we reintegrate at yet a higher level. So we're pushing our discernment here with these talks. Um, I love diagrams to explain some of this, and I don't have paper with me today, but I feel like you imagine that this is our self state, and these are some of the distinctions in our lives that we can notice. Um, as we learn greater distinctions, there's something outside of our current realm of experiencing space and time and self that we want to start to include. So then we have to increase our sense of space and time and self in order to include that part. And then there's more integration happening. Um, so both distinction and both the depth of space, the depth of the experience of time are continually increasing and taking turns to include each other. What do you mean by distinction? What's an example? I'm asking what an example of distinction is. Um, one example for me is experiencing emotion in the body like Heidi was mentioning. Um, I can notice like, oh, I'm feeling sad. And there can be more and more nuance to that. I can learn what it's like pointing to. And... Um, in kind of every direction? In every direction. So what it's pointing to cognitively, what it's pointing to in these other other dimensions? Yeah, where it came from, the nature of it right now, the texture becomes a lot more clear and uh, in higher resolution, uh, where it's pointing me to towards in, in the future. Um, all of those distinctions become, become more refined. And similarly, like with culture and um, other experiences, you can imagine like going through the four quadrants. So I have a, I have a question. Um, if we can hog the mic for another second, um, is uh, for me personally, 
sometimes I drown in the volume of possible directions to go. If, so if, if we're aware of a particular experience or maybe just one or two or three of these dimensions, like I'm having a feeling, I'm tracking it somatically, I'm having an emotion, I'm tracking it somatically as well, and I'm noticing some cognitive activity that's, that's going on at the same time. There are so many directions that is possible to go, and I have a limited amount of attention. And I'm curious um, about how people choose simply making the decision of which direction to go to explore. I'm curious about that guidance in order to fuel useful development, exploration, and eventually integration. Um, I have something that builds on a little bit on what Natalie was saying, actually. Like, I've heard sometimes people having this this mind-body dualism. This is something me and Ryan were talking about. And because it occurs to me that I think the more, if you have like rock solid distinction, you, like you can actually have where the mind and the body come together. Like more mind could be more body, for example. Like, um, and kind of to, to spread my chakra energy of like kind of second emotional feeling and throat. For example, like I can be sat there and have no idea what I'm feeling. Um, so I'm just lost in this suit. Um, kind of as Debbie was saying, and then I can have an insight about, okay, I'm, I'm angry, or I'm sad, like that's one level, or okay, I'm angry and I'm sad, and this is because of the, the, these things that happen. Um, so it's part of me, uh, Tim, in your question, like, there's part of me that I think is a bit mysterious, like some of it I think is gut instincts. Like I think I've noticed this because I definitely get into a state when I, I notice my integral state where I'm kind of lost, like I see all this stuff in this map, and I'm like, okay, I see, all, I see all these options, but I'm not sure which to, to choose. But there's something about combining the mind with the body where if I go around making more distinctions, then I have more detail about the territory. Um, I can actually see more about the options I'm dealing with. And then sooner or later, it starts to get more in my body and it kind of becomes like obvious um, what to do. But I think, it's, I think it's both. I think it's both like a kind of embodiment and also like using your brain in order to to find more about the options you're dealing with or the territory that you're you're interacting with so in my experience is that when we use too much the brain we begin to to tell stories mm. to invent stories and that is because of that and that is because of that and then we are very far away from what is actually happening so i in these situations i try really to listen to get concentrated on what is happening and to listen and listen and listen if something comes up. And uh, it's very easy to get distracted, at least in my experience. And uh, some, something you know from the outside world is immediately getting my attention. So always coming back and try to listen to what is um, emerging in me, what is happening in me and to, to make sense in a non-story way. <laughs> if possible, but just out of the the body feeling of the emotional feeling of, of, of that sensing. It's more sensing into into the the whole situation than dividing it into into categories. More in, into, indeed it hmm? go ahead. Indeed it it seems that this capacity and this capability to listen is integral it becomes more and more at the forefront as we grow up as well as wake up. And as we move from this gross discrimination into these subtle distinctions and then refining into discernment, through listening in that process, rather than talking, rather than looking out, rather than, than reading, but to writing and to reflecting and to listening to who we are, like allowing what wants to emerge. And I think it's just you know, critical in deciphering and discerning one of two directions to go. One, the one direction being more and more into who we are and the other direction being less and less into who we are. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderfully put. Okay, I'll bounce off of that. Thank you, Devin. Um, the listening, yes, that's I ask myself, where does my energy want to go? 
and the listening is, yeah, that's probably listen it inside. But I'll bounce off of that to answer the question Heidi put to me a while back because it involves listening. Heidi, I think you asked me to give an example from my life of when I tried to use a hard, dark emotion to go someplace positive. Um, Try to do this in real short. A friend of mine who's dying and um, doesn't have enough money for groceries and so on, and I'm trying, you know, I'm determined not to abandon her in her need, but she can be manipulative, you know, it's my judgment. But after spending some time with her recently, I came home and I was, first it was physical. It's like, I want to eat a candy bar that has lots and lots of nuts. Well, I'm, I'm diabetic. I, you know, and I had this urge for that candy bar. I could taste it. I could feel it. And so I listened. What's underneath this? Anger. And I didn't want to admit this. I was furious at this gal. No, no, I have, I'm a compassionate being. No, I was furious. She was, and I find kind of, I had to listen to myself. And this was nonviolent. If I hadn't had a lot of some nonviolent communication, I couldn't have taken it down these levels. But okay, listen to myself. She was manipulating me to write her a check for $3,000 to go do some thing I don't think she needs when she doesn't even have money, when I'm buying her groceries because she doesn't have money for groceries. But she refuses to, and it's, she's in a lot of denial and she wants to go for another wacko treatment. So I'm listening to my anger. I was angry. And so I sat with the anger. So what I did was I went to the gym and worked out. You know, I've got this anger and it's anger. And it has to, and so I released it through my body. I got a good workout. And then I could use my rudimentary NVC skills to go deeper and sit with it. And once I'd let the anger do something positive, like give me a good workout. And Paul said something about that earlier. Then I could kind of sit with that and see what's driving her is terror then I had to go through my own process, my own stuff, and then I could see her terror. And then I could have compassion for her terror. I'm not gonna write her that check for $3,000. I need that money for other things. I will continue to help her buy some groceries. But now I'm left, and and with greater insight comes greater responsibility. Jung had a lot to say about this, but now I'm dancing with this, pardon? It's about three minutes and 30. Thank you. so now, now I'm left with, you know, how do I deal skillful with my friend? And that's subtle, nuanced, and not easy, but I'm not going to abandon her. Thank you. That was a good example. Yeah, how about that? Even when people are suffering and dying, they do boundary violations and blah, 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 blah. So that's a great um, teaching example from real life. The question you asked him is a terrific one. I'm just appreciating uh, that you brought it up. You didn't use the word navigation, but that's what I heard, is that you're asking people, how do you navigate? You know, How does this not be just this sensory, conceptual, physical, emotional swill of... Uh, manifold, seemingly infinite ideas and concepts and experiences. And what came up for me immediately was revisiting, well, how do I do that? And the way I, first of all, genuine practice, that is not mental practice, but embodied practice and many years of it, helps a lot because I would say, you know, if I've practiced for 45 years, probably spent the first 20 or so of it kind of doing a mental thing, a mental kind of practice. Um, So anyway, my response is I experience it as Um, a very organic integration of instinct and intuition. Instinct being like being a good animal, sensing what's going on in myself, other, and the environment. And instinct, uh, that's instinct. And then intuition being a rather uh, rarefied, 
refined, ongoingly refined energetic sensing of what's going on in what's arising and what's going on in those domains. And that there's this natural marriage of those, of both instinct and intuition. And that's how I navigate. Thank, thanks for sharing that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Natalie. You haven't spoken in a while. Go for it, Ryan. Oh, um, oh I'll, just, I'll just say that. I appreciate the, um, what you said, Davey, about the instinct and the intuition. And that's exactly what I feel when I do sports or like um, boxing and martial arts. And I also think there's a, it's very bodily and very instinctive, but also very intuitive. And it incorporates a lot of listening and a lot of mental analytic thinking where I'm playing chess and the other guy's playing checkers. And in boxing, they call it fight IQ or like in sports, like basketball IQ. Mm -hmm. And to me, all those things come together. If you watch like Michael Jordan playing basketball, like you can see his instincts, but like he's highly, highly analytical mental. Like he's thinking every next step and he's always one step ahead of the defender who's defending him. Um, but to, to go back to your question, Tim, I, the first thing that came up for me was, wouldn't that depend on what context you're in and how you would navigate something? So it, how you would navigate your interior, you know, all these, where you put your attention to, should I put, uh, put, put on my emotions and do work on my emotional intelligence? Should I work, so look at my thoughts and do cognitive behavioral therapy on myself, right? I think that would depend on if you're in the meditation cushion, trying to work through something, but if, or if you're in a different context, like in the boxing ring, I probably wouldn't be putting my attention on my emotions. I'd be putting my attention on the other guy's fists, right? So does that, so maybe that's a follow-up question to you back. Would, could you explain a little bit more about like what, context you're talking about yeah right <clears throat> thank you for that um question i i want to share an image that i had while you were talking actually which is that in every individual context right there's a uh, like in the boxing gym maybe your coach says hey here's what i want you to work on first you're gonna walk up you're gonna work on your stance or whatever your coach decides. It doesn't actually matter too much mm -hmm. if they choose one of any five of the basic foundational things, but it's probably important that they do one of those five before they do one of the more advanced things that builds on them. And so I feel like it's a little bit like parenting. You know, we start out and, and it's true that there could be tons of different subcultural activities for a child to engage in, but it's helpful for them to have structure. And I think what I'm, what I'm struggling with a little bit is that at some point, I, I think I sort of dropped out as a sort of just a share about my own psychological development or behavioral development or whatever you want to say. Um, but I think I've been aware of many, many, many different choices of directions to go, but I haven't felt uh, that trust internally. Someone was saying about, you know, instinct or, I think of it as like some people learn, I think of it as developmental trauma where we are taught by our parents, not, it's not something we're born with. We're taught to sort of recognize our desire to expand or contract and how to meet that desire in, in, in particular contexts. Oh, this context is hunger. So I'm feeling uncomfortable, but I'm going to eat now because that will actually help meet that need. And then I'm going to digest because I've eaten enough. Um, and so the impression I have from talking to people and to you about the context is you're asking what context and, and I've been floating in this thing of like, well, what context should I be in? Does that make sense? Like it's really, really, really uh, formless. Um, so I think part of the challenge I've had is that I realize there's a zillion contexts. I could put myself in many of them. I don't know where to go in that way. So there's an indecision that happens. And so I've spent a lot of time uh, maybe to what uh, Natalie shared earlier, not being distinctive, not just sticking my attention in one place, developing that, okay, now I've got that down. Now I can go be in another place, but I was doing a little bit like very poorly formed here and then here and then here and just sort of looping between maybe many places without actually getting traction anywhere. I know Natalie wanted to say something. She, she let me kind of interject here. Um, but so I don't, um, maybe she can interject and maybe we can feed back into your question, Ryan. So hopefully that answers it a little bit. Excuse me, I have to walk out the door now. I apologize. So I'm going to jump in here with a slight orthogonal to your point, but wherever 
we put our attention, we're putting our consciousness, and that takes us straight to the not the, to the empty witness, very high beyond causal stage. So we're coming from a very high spiritual state when we're wherever we're putting our pure consciousness as a deliberate choice. We're that that that's that's the the non-dual witness. So with that, I'm so sorry. I have to leave. This is awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Check out the video because I feel like what I'm going to share may help clarify all this if this is a question that's valuable. Bye. <laughs> so um, I feel right now I just want to take ownership. There's a lot of excitement in my body, a lot of energy. Um, and I oh, feel like this can be a really valuable tool for integrating um, your, your question, Tim. Um, so what I, what I recognize is that um, Though we, we label gross, subtle, and causal, and maybe um, they can be associated with physical, emotional, and mental, um, as we move through the developmental stages of experience, um, our states correlate in that way where red is about the gross, magenta is about the emotional and the subtle state, and um, blue is about the uh, mental, and the causal state. We start to recognize that there's something beyond um, the, the constructs that, um, that we're creating. We get in touch with spirit. And then we form a solid sense of self. And then we're in orange, and that's also a very mental state. Um, and we start to then um, loop back down through the states in order to experience greater differentiation. Where in green, we're working on the emotional again, but we're back into the subtle realm. And then in integral, we're in the um, gross, but we're in the gross um, in... Um, we're in the gross in, in a different way than when we were experiencing it in in red. So my, my recommendation is, let me pause here to make sure that I'm explaining this clearly. Um, when it's hard for us to make a decision about the right path forward to um, either broaden our state experience or to get more specific about our state experience. If I, uh, so I'll use a, a specific example. The other day I was teaching NBC in prison. This is one of my first classes in this way where I was hosting and I was managing my, um, my nervousness by stepping into the causal state through the physical experience of my body. I was managing my autonomic nervous system versus um, in the past, you want to just finish that thought, Natalie? We're about two minutes and 35 seconds. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the past, I was in more of a green stage, and so I would manage my nervousness by getting in touch with my emotions and naming them clearly. I was in the subtle realm of moving energies around in my body. Um, I feel like I can say this a little bit more clearly. I'll practice a bit and come back to it. Thank you. Um, I, I really like the distinction you said, Nani, about basically broadening or shrinking it down. And I had this burning thing um, about your question, Tim. But I think like what you're describing is like, um, like really rock solid thing that is like comes out integral that's really difficult, or or is just like seems to me like really part of the territory. Like I experience this kind of state all the time, where it's kind of like seeing all of these options and not knowing what to do. And I kind of make a thing between what Nanny was talking about, a broadening or a shrinking. That it, I would say like shrinking is more going towards my physical body. Like something grounded is going to give me the, the thing to do. Or the opposite, that I'll go towards the causal and actually not, not knowing what to do or not seeing the wholeness or not seeing something is actually um, part of it. I'm not sure if like, I'm not sure if this is your experience as well, but I think part of the reason I felt quite burning is I think I've had a, I think I've often like felt a sense of shame around it or a sense of being lost because maybe it is a thing that comes out of integral or like, um, 
you know, feeling like, oh, I should know what I'm doing because other people seem to like, you know, green, they're probably dealing with their emotions or orange, they're off doing stuff in the world or something like this. And not knowing like where to, to put this state of being about not knowing what to do. Um, and I guess that also somewhat pulls it back into the whole, the whole debate about states. Because to me, I think I found this useful talking to integral people is I was, I'm kind of able to reown that state because I kind of see it coming. I'm like, oh, I see this is kind of causal. This is a need to be more embodied. And then I can, I can run with it. But um, yeah, the most burning thing, I guess I would kind of say is that I, I think that's pretty normal, uh, integral. Um, for me anyway, it's pretty, it's pretty sort of fundamental to whenever I feel like I'm in an integral space. And I just clarifying. Paul, um, you say you think that's normal, and then you said something for integral, or and I don't know what that means. It's normal to my experience from like high school on, but I'm not sure what you mean when you say for integral. I think to me it just feels like a a state I so often go to when I'm dealing with something integral. Like I'm I'm thinking of things in an integral way. I'm not seeing the big picture, or for example. I've said quite a few times that it seems to me a lot of Kundalini starts to come out integral and the opposite of that is also true. It's kind of like, I'm going to let go. I'm going to end up being uh, empty to be able to hold that. And the thing that you were saying about like not even knowing the context, it's not even like, Oh, I have these three options and I have to choose one of the three to me. And this is what I heard in what you were saying. Maybe you can correct me, but it's almost like uh, there isn't even that. It's just like I see, I see vast options, and none of them uh, come out as anything that I'm going to run with. So it, it just sounds like very causal to me. Like there's no roadmaps anywhere or something. Is the is my state experience of anyway? Um, Tim, I want also to share with you that, that I feel that very familiar to me what you have said, and. Um, I think it has to do either with the character we are coming into the, uh, not character, the, the disposition with which we come into the world, maybe sort of karma, previous lives, whatever, uh, I don't know. Um, and I, I think, yeah, we might be ashamed of it that we don't uh, be in accordance to what is expected from us to make a career or to make what, whatever, you know, and fit into the normal way of being. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, having this super passion and working like crazy to, uh, to, to reach what you want to reach is good, but it's also a slavery. So I think we sort of have chosen a, a, a middle way and I'm still trying to figure out what, <laughs> what that is about. And what I normally do in, in the past, I did decisions from my mind, you know, and I often found out that that was not good, that I actually uh, came into, into very bad places with that. So now I have learned to let it be and wait and listen what I said before, and then something will happen and will get me into a certain direction, and then I will do that, even if it has nothing to do with what uh, I was doing so far. And I have changed my interests and deep interests and working on, on things several times in my life. And, you know, I, I begin to accept that it is as it is. Amen. <laughs> Yeah, Tim, it's, um, and everyone, it's really, what you're describing, it's very familiar to me. I've had uh, that experience, repeatedly different iterations of it my entire life. Um, you probably won't be overjoyed to hear that it actually kind of gets worse or more intense. And um, I don't mean this in a disparaging way or to dumb it down at all. It, it's really a, a form, I see it as a form of FOMO, like fear of missing out. In myself, I experience it that way. And um, one of the things I've found paradoxically through retreating and more solitude and more 
unscheduled time and less goal orientation and less being driven and more trusting that marriage of instinct and intuition, which I think probably naturally I have a lot of both. And I appreciate that not everyone, you know, comes with that set that they may have different, you know, um, capacities. The paradoxically, as I expose myself to less, oh, another big piece is, you know, just the sheer amount of data, information, media, a uh, number of points of view and so forth that each one of us is dealing with every day is exponentially increasing. And by the way, at least my examination continually shows that like 90, I'm just picking a high, a high number here, but 98, 99, maybe 99.9% .9 of it is noise, not signal. And the real key is how do I make that distinction? And also if I make the wrong choice, that most of them aren't, permanent, you can change your mind, mostly you can change your mind right away. And that most of it's noise and you can notice it and ignore it. And then I'll just uh, finish because I don't want to go on and on. This is a topic I could talk about a lot. Yeah, thanks, Davey. Uh, We're about to wrap up. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, when I was growing up, there were three kinds of toothpaste. Yeah, we are at the end of the one and a half hours. And so I want to give everybody uh, the occasion. One minute, um, one minute check out. Well, I will just say thank you all very much for um, responding to me. And um, my experience has been one of connection uh, and been very reassuring as well as hearing some things that I've that I've known before and some things that I haven't. And um, so feeling really held in this little group. Thank you so much. Um, I can check out. Um, so one of the ways that I navigate this is patience. And I've heard many of you say that patience and intuition. And so when there's a, a challenge up, I use the states to navigate it, to um, continue taking action and to hold that patience and that big picture spaciousness um, with, my, with my body and my mind and, and my emotions and listening to the subtle directions that they're pointing to in each moment with that patience. Um, I think for me, again, it was like uh, kind of getting into a topic and thinking like, oh, I don't know if I really think that much about states or whatever. And then feeling really empowered now and kind of realizing how big a, a bigger subject it is and kind of appreciating various shares that people brought in that I thought were really useful. And um, yeah, I don't, to me, I was kind of just filled with this whole just constant throat chakra thing, like even Debbie's last share about noise and sort of um, most of it, it is noise or people were talking a lot about listening um, or having distinctions. Um, kind of flow and harmony and all this kind of stuff. So um, I feel like I'm, I don't know, I'm gonna go away and think about that. I think there's something something to that, but I think the most empowering thing to me is just being really excited about states actually. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. And I'll simply close with uh, appreciation for the last hour and a half here today. Thanks, folks. I'll just close by saying, um, Tim, I, I look forward to talking to you about more about this uh, later on. And um, I think on, on two notes, there's a big picture context and there's a moment in, in this moment context. And um, I think for me, in, in this moment, in each moment where, you, you, where a choice may come up, to use a boxing analogy again, you know, when I'm teaching people boxing, there's a lot of moving parts. There's head movement, there's, you know, footwork, there's hands, and people are always like, I don't know what to do when I'm in a fight. And after a while, 
it just kind of synthesizes. You just focus on one thing, and it all just comes together somehow, some way. It just, there's just one truth of the moment that you just tune into and laser in on, and it somehow it works out. Big picture, I felt lost my entire life, and I'm and the and I just say that I've become at peace with it by just learning to be lost, and I'm not going to ever find my path. And that's when I was able to just find my path by not finding my path, if that makes sense. So thank you, everyone. Evie, your minute check out. I, uh, hopefully, the more we know or the more we think we know, the more we know we don't know. Maybe because our interface with the unknown expands exponentially. So a ways back, um, I think it was you, Tim, you used the word trust. There's a certain trust that I think comes. I feel much more trust of my own capacity to navigate amidst all the noise and confusion that I did in the past. So trust your instinct, trust your intuition, practice, and trust. I know trust, it's easy to say, but that's what it's like for me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. What I so appreciate and, and this, of this group that we are sort of all ages, you know, that the young people, older people, and from my, I'm certainly part of the older people. And I can say uh, during life, there are many, many, uh, how do you say, periods, many, many time sections. And you know perfectly when one is over and then the next one uh, starts. Maybe you don't feel the next one when it starts, but you feel definitely when one is over. And we are learning. And the thing is, we need to not try to be perfect <laughs> right away, <laughs> if ever, and just uh, live the life we have and use all our capacities to do something good something good in the sense meaningful for us and as Jordan Peterson says, for our families, for our communities and so on. And I think that's a good orientation to, towards life and acceptance. And, but that's what meditation seems also to want to teach, you know, to, to be in harmony with, with what is. And I thank you very much to be here. I have been here with me, with us. And in this formation, we see again next Sunday, while on Thursday at an hour later, there will be some crossfire, I guess. Huh? Ryan, is there already a topic? Yeah, I'm going to um, email everyone and see how we should proceed with setting up the next one. I, I, it seems like some pretty juicy topics came out of the last one that I want to continue with that momentum. I'm not sure how we should proceed exactly with how that should be set up or how to frame the topic. So I would like everyone's input. So look forward to okay. hearing from everyone. Perfect. And don't forget to go every now and then to the, the Damiano website. Also, he is not here because he is immersed in work. But um, the, the forum there is there. And I think we should use it a little bit more to interconnect between us uh, also in the, uh, during the other days where we don't meet. Okay. So thank you and see you next time. Bye bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Lots of love to you. Yeah. Aloha. Bye. Aloha.